I'm Taylor Perrone. I'm an assistant professor in Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences at MIT. And I'm a geomorphologist, which means that I study how geological processes shape landscapes on Earth and on other planets. And there are uh, three themes within that that we study in my group. The first is uh, how patterns emerge in landscapes. And that can mean anything ranging from river networks that you might see on the ground when you're flying in an airplane, all the way down to ripples in sand that you might see while you're at a beach. The second theme is that we try to understand how climate, and especially rainfall and sunlight, influence landscapes. And the third theme is that we study landscapes on other planets and moons and try to understand how they're different from the ones we see on Earth. To do this, we, we use a few different methods. First, we do field work, so we actually go out and study the landscapes directly and make measurements. Uh, two, we use remote sensing data, which means satellite images and often topographic data that's collected by laser scanning from airplanes. We use laboratory experiments sometimes if we can take processes and either shrink them down or do them at the same scale and simulate them in the lab. And then we use computer models where we come up with mathematical descriptions of how landscapes change over time and then solve those in a computer. Here are two animations of river networks evolving over time. And in each case, you're looking down on the landscape, uh, and you're seeing shadows as you might see them cast by the sun at an angle. So the sun's coming from up here. And the color is showing you the elevation. So uh, cooler colors, bluer colors are lower elevations, and redder colors are higher elevations. And each of these you could think of as being kind of like a square mountain range. And so there's rock that's being pushed up by tectonic forces, and erosion processes are eroding the rock away. And the topography you see forming as a result of the balance between those two processes. As you can see down here in the bottom, these are scale bars for you. So this is a 500 meter scale bar. This is a 10 kilometer scale bar. And these words tell you uh, what the uh, time lapse is. So each second in the movie, in this case, is 100,000 years. And in this case, each second is 400,000 years. And the thing that's most obvious uh, between these two movies is that in this case, you see uh, smooth slopes, smooth ridge lines that are in between all of the valleys. And you see the branching river networks resolved at a finer scale. And in this landscape over here, you see the landscape as you would perceive it if you were viewing it from a larger distance. So you're seeing a much larger area. And as a result, you can see that in this landscape, there's a lot of dynamic adjustment of the river basins. Some of them grow at the expense of others, the others shrink, and you can see all of these ridge lines in between the basins moving around over time. So when you speed up the landscape like this, you can see what a dynamic process the evolution of topography is. In this movie, there's much less adjustment relative to the size of the landscape because at large scales, the river networks get set into their locations very early on and don't change as much. Here we're looking in Google Earth at a landscape in Baja, California that looks similar to the model simulation that you saw on the left a minute ago. And you can see that although the boundaries here are a little bit less regular than the, the square ones you saw a minute ago, that we have rivers that are cutting into the landscape here and lowering the base level that all these other slopes are then responding to. So the rivers cutting in steepen the slopes and speed up erosion. The rest of the landscape starts to erode as a result. And you can see that there are some very regular patterns that have developed in the topography here. You can see that there are branching river networks where each of these channels has tributaries that come off on either side. And you can also see that there's kind of a characteristic spacing of the ridges and valleys that emerges here as well. And these are both things that we can predict with computational models. In this animation, you're seeing a movie taken underneath uh, the water surface in a tank that we've built that generates waves with a paddle. 
the waves travel down the tank in this direction and they create a flow of water that moves back and forth over a bed of sand. And as the flow moves back and forth, you can see that it's moving sand with it. And as that process occurs, it generates ripples that then grow until they reach the form you see here. And what we're interested in doing is coming up with a mathematical description of this process so we can predict the patterns that emerge in ripples. And to help us do that, we've done these laboratory experiments in the wave tank so that we can watch how the ripple patterns evolve over time and test the mathematical model we come up with. Here's a movie of an experiment running in the wave tank. This is in a warehouse on the MIT campus and you're looking down at an angle from above. And so you can see this is a tank that's about seven meters long. It has an open top and it's filled with water. And there's a paddle at one end that's being driven by a motor and that makes the waves. And the waves then travel along the tank and they get absorbed at the other end by a little beach we've created. And so the sand is on the bed of the tank and even though the waves are traveling in one direction, the particles in the water just move back and forth. And so that sweeps the sand back and forth and that's the process that makes ripples. So we can run these experiments for as long as we want, usually for about 12 hours per experiment. And then we take uh, pictures from a time-lapse camera that's up above the tank. So then we can speed up the process of ripple evolution and see how ripples change over those 12-hour experiments. Now you're looking at a time-lapse movie taken from the camera that's vertically above the wave tank. And each second in the movie is 10 minutes in real time. So this is sped up quite a bit. And what you're seeing is the bed of sand with a spotlight that's coming from the left. So these shadows here tell you where the crests of the ripples are. And you are seeing ripples that spread from an initial hump in the middle of the bed. And you can see that they propagate out over the entire bed until they fill the space. And then there are some adjustment that goes on where there are little irregularities in the ripple patterns that then smooth out over time as the ripple crests migrate and either disappear or join with other crests. Here's an experiment where we start with a bed that's adjusted to the wave conditions and then we change the waves by changing the way the paddle moves and watch how the ripples adjust. And we've changed the paddle motion in a way that creates a ripple spacing that is narrower than it was at the beginning. So this is one of the most interesting parts of this process to us is ha watching how the ripple patterns adjust when they're forced to do so. So what you'll see in this experiment is that you start with ripple crests that are mostly parallel. And then over time, you see smaller crests that start to grow in the troughs between the existing ripples. And now you're looking at a late stage in the adjustment. We'll wait for a minute and it'll start again. So now you can see small crests start to grow in an offset pattern where there were none before. And they make the ripples on either side bow out. And over time, those smaller crests will lengthen and join up with some of the existing crests until you have a ripple spacing that's narrower than it was before. And we can make measurements of how fast this happens and how exactly it occurs by studying the time-lapse movies. Now we're seeing a computer model of the process that we just watched in the wave tank experiment where we have a model for flow over a bed of sand and the transport of sand by the water. And we've also made a change in the wave conditions that force the ripples to go from a wider spacing to a narrower spacing. And so there are two things that you can see happening in this animation. It'll start again for us in just a minute. The first is that you'll see secondary crests, like the ones we just saw, growing in the troughs of the existing crests, and then migrating and linking up with the larger crests. And then as that occurs, over the longer term, there are other defects, other irregularities that remain in the ripple field. So we see these features which sedimentologists call tuning forks, which you see both in modern sand and in ancient ripples preserved in rocks. 
and little loops like the one that was right there. And here's an image from a rock outcrop in Arizona showing some ancient ripples that have been preserved in a sandstone. And you can see these tuning forks that have been sitting there waiting for a geologist to come along and interpret them.